All right, good afternoon. Uh, I'm joining you today uh, for the Adult School of Ministry, lesson number 10. Uh, we're talking about Christ's messages to the churches, part two, from Revelations chapter uh, 3 today. Uh, before we get into the lesson uh, proper today, let me make a few announcements. Um, remember that uh, our services on Sunday are uh, at 10 a.m., one service right now on 10 a.m. Uh, for um, uh, adult youth and adult services, no children's services yet or nursery. We're still working on that. Things kind of change almost weekly, and so we apologize. I know you're anxious to get back in the building and to have your children and grandchildren back here, and we are too, believe me. Uh, Dad is not with us today, and uh, so um, I I'm in the room by myself. I sure wish there was a room full of people here. But, uh, but we're, we're going to do what we got to do to get the word out. And, uh, uh, and, and I know that many of you uh, are, are watching on Sundays after this post on Sunday afternoons or Sunday mornings around 1145. I'm getting comments and some thoughts and emails from you about the lesson. So thank you so much for watching. Also remember that uh, the, uh, tonight, starting at midnight, we are going to resume our all-night prayer. So tonight from midnight until 6 a.m. tomorrow, morning we will have prayer here in the sanctuary uh, and uh, you can go to our app and check more information about that also um, we are um, continuing with the zoom room call on sundays pastor evenson if you can join him uh, you can call the church office for more information on how to join that uh, also uh, that will be from 12 15 till 12 45 on Sunday, so please participate. Anybody that hasn't been in a while or hasn't been in, uh, watching online or hasn't had a connection recently, uh, would love, Pastor would love for you to join and to, to uh, share with them and ask any questions or thoughts uh, on the message that day or just some concerns you have, a prayer request. So uh, please join him uh, Sunday at 1215. We have several that we want to pray for. Our prayer list has been uh, rather long this week and we've had uh, some who've lost uh, loved ones that are in directly, uh, not directly related to our church, but Nolan uh, Reed, Philomena's husband, lost his sister in California. We want to pray for Philomena and Nolan and their family. Uh, we've also uh, had some others who have been hospitalized this week or been in the ER um, for uh, various uh, illnesses or injuries. And so we just want to pray. We'll pray for Dave Turpin. He did get an MRI back. He has a torn meniscus. We want to pray for Dave and the surgery that's upcoming to repair that. Also, Joanne Sampson's had some falls this week. We want to pray for Joanne and touch her physically. We want to pray for um, Ushi Thies's, uh, uh daughters and uh, just uh, a, a special need of prayer there. And also uh, several that are still uh, indirectly connected to our church with family members all across the country, several who family members have had COVID and recovering. We thank the Lord that Reverend Bracey was discharged from the hospital, but he still has COVID. Um, he lost his mother while he was in the hospital with COVID, and we will pray for him and that the Lord would give him peace as well, and he and his family. Uh, we have uh, some senior adults and others that are just uh, missing church, want to be involved, want to be active, um, and they're just because of the COVID restrictions and various things and transportation issues. You just want to pray uh, peace and comfort upon our people. Uh, this is not a time to fear. This is a time to trust. And so uh, the message today, the Sunday school lesson, num lesson number 10, talking about Christ in the revelation of John um, and, and his message to the churches today, I think will give us encouragement, also challenge us uh, in our thoughts as well. But uh, let's pray and ask the Lord to minister to, to these needs and also uh, to thank Him for His provision, to thank Him for His many blessings to us. Uh, and and um, you know, without Him, uh, we could do nothing. Without Him, we are nothing. And so I thank the Lord for uh, His blessing and His provision. Father, we come before You this morning uh, this afternoon, just Lord, with, with uh, a heart of thankfulness, of gratitude toward you, Father Lord, for your Son, Jesus Christ, for eternal life, Father Lord. But, but Lord, it's not just a future reality that, Lord, we're looking forward to, but a present reality in which we're currently in. 
we thank you, Father Lord, that you are here, that we are with you, Lord, and, and that we're, we're, we, we are a dual citizen. We're a citizen of, of our country, but we're also a citizen of a spiritual kingdom. And Lord, Father, that, that puts us in, in a, a current action, action situation right now in the world in which we live, but also in the reality to come. But that reality to come has already begun because we're in a relationship with you. So we thank you so much for that, Father. And we just give you blessing and praise and glory and honor. We thank you for meeting our material needs, our, our physical needs, healing our bodies, touching us, Lord, mentally and spiritually. We thank you for touching our emotions, Lord, giving us peace during a difficult, traumatic time. Father, Lord, ran, evil is ramping up. Father, Lord, we know that, that we are truly living in the last days. We are seeing... Uh, evil wax worse and worse but yet lord also we've seen a presence of your spirit that's greater than ever before father lord and we're anticipating a move of your presence we're anticipating a great revival father lord upon the earth we give you praise father and we thank you lord for your word we thank you for its its message to us father lord and how it's applicable to our daily living our daily life and father lord so from this lesson today May you, your word just uh, penetrate our hearts, penetrate our spirits, and Father, Lord, draw us closer to you. We pray for those that are in the hospital. We pray for the, those that uh, have been had time in the hospital this week and are back. We thank you, Lord. Touch Joanne Sampson. Touch, Lord, whatever's causing these falls. We just pray that you administer your peace and grace and healing to her. We pray, Father, Lord, for Nolan and Philomena and the loss of Nolan's sister in California. Bless that family with the peace of God. We pray, Lord, that you administer to Ushi's daughters, Lord, that need you. We pray, Father, that you administer, Father Lord, in a powerful way, Lord, to our shut-ins, Father, that, that, are, that are not able to get out, not able to, to socialize much. We just pray, Father, that you would encourage them. May the peace of God come into their home, come into their mind, their hearts, their spirits, Lord, and refresh them, renew them, encourage them, Father, in the word. We thank you for your blessings. And now, Father Lord, once again, we ask your blessing upon the, the reading and studying of your word as we go in this lesson in the next few moments. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. As I mentioned, uh, we are talking about the Christ's messages to the churches. We're talking about, uh, we began this series last week, uh, lesson last week in part one, talking about the message to the seven churches and uh, Christ. Uh, in this lesson, we're going to see uh, admonishes the churches, uh, he, and he also encourages the churches. And if you remember last week, we talked about how that there was a pattern on, in all of the lessons that there is typically a, either a commendation, a uh, command, uh, a rebuke, and a promise. And so we see that pattern for the most part through all of the seven letters to the churches. And this lesson, as I mentioned, is part two of our looking at the seven uh, letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor. Remember we said that the seven churches were in, would basically, if you looked at a map, would form a basic triangle that would follow trade routes uh, that were in the uh, western Asia Minor or western Turkey would be uh, the area today. The, the lesson today, we're going to look at the letters to the churches in Sardis, Philadelphia and Laodicea. And in all three uh, churches, we see that Jesus uses examples from the city of their location to illustrate his message to each of those churches. We see that Sardis uh, was um, boasted of its vibrancy, but Jesus actually says you're dead. And he was encouraging them to be spiritually alert. Philadelphia was actually weak, but they enjoyed the favor of, 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 the, of the strong Lord. They were a weak church, but they were favoring. They, they, they had the favor of the Lord upon them. Laodicea claimed abundance, uh, but in reality was very wretched and poor. And so he was challenging them to be zealous and to repent. And um, so we're, we're going to see that in each case in the letters today, the Lord called on the church to look to him for help. And so um, that's what we need to do in the, in the world in which we live, the chaos in which we see around us. You know, we, we should not fear. We should not be afraid, but we should look to the Lord for our help. And we see that as he gave the church's promises, he gives us promises. And, and those promises that if we will overcome the evil in the world, uh, he will uh, give these blessings to us. And so um, the, uh, the book of Revelation uh, there are several 
uh, repeated features in each of the letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor. And there, there are six things that are repeated. Number one, Jesus describes himself in terms of the vision revealed to John in chapter 1. So he talks about himself to the seven churches as he identified or described himself in chapter 1. The second thing is that's repeated is that the church is commended for its faithfulness. The third thing is that the church is also, yet it's commended, but he's also rebuking the church for spiritual and or moral failure in the church. The fourth thing we see that's repeated in these letters is that Jesus commands of the church an appropriate response to his rebuke. In other words, he's encouraging them to respond in the right manner to my rebuke. He's not rebuking to be mean or harsh or ugly, uh, but he, he is rebuking because he loves the church and he wants the church to change. So rather than us, the church, taking an attitude and offense, he want, Jesus wants his church to respond appropriately uh, to his uh, rebuke. He then replies, or, or promises, excuse me, he promises blessing to those who will remain faithful to him and that will, those that will overcome evil. And then the last thing that he does, the sixth thing, is that the church is commanded to hear the message of Christ uh, uh, through the, the voice of the Holy Spirit. So in other words, um, we see the triune God. We see God the Father in the message expressed through His Son, Jesus, and Jesus is expressed through, and the truth of who Christ is is revealed by the Holy Spirit. So, uh, now, occasionally we mentioned this last week, and we'll remind you again this week, is that the rebuke or the uh, commendation may be omitted occasionally, or the order in which those three items are in each church could be slightly changed. Um, and we're going to see that in the uh, uh, second point of today's lesson, the church at Philadelphia, there was no rebuke. There was a commendation, there was a command, and there was a promise, but there was no rebuke. Uh, the other two, we see that there was, in Sardis, there was a rebuke, there was a commendation for some, and a promise. We see in Laodicea that there is a rebuke and a command and a promise, but there's no commendation. So there, there's occasionally there's a slight variance in some of the letters, but for the most part we see these patterns uh, repeated. Uh, and so let's, let's look today, if you have your Bibles, let's open to Revelation chapter 3 and let's read verses 1 through 6. Write this letter to the angel of the church at Sardis. This is the message from the one who has the, the sevenfold Spirit of God and the seven stars. So see, there is a reference. Remember I just said that Jesus refers to himself in the seven letters to the churches in the same way in which he described himself in John cha or Revelation chapter 1 as John saw him revealed. So here, uh, the church at Sardis, he says, this is the one from the one who holds or has the sevenfold spirit of God and the seven stars. Notice what he says in the latter part of verse 1, I know all the things you do and that you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Verse 2, wake up, strengthen what little remains, for even what is left is almost dead. I find that your actions do not meet the requirements of my God. Go back to what you heard and believed at first. Hold to it firmly. Repent and turn to me again. If you don't wake up, I will come to you suddenly as uh, unexpected as a thief. Yet there are some in the church in Sardis who have not sold their clothes with evil. They will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. All who are victorious will be clothed in white. I will never erase their names from the book of life, but I will announce before my Father and His angels that they are mine. Anyone who hears with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what He is saying to the churches. The city of Sardis boasted of a history that stretched back to more than a thousand years before the time of Christ. The area geography around Sardis, uh, it, it was actually located on a real craggy uh, mountain peak. It was really difficult 
for uh, invaders to get to the city of Sardis. There were also nearby deposits of gold, uh, and therefore the church at Sardis and the community at Sardis was very wealthy. The city of Sardis was very wealthy. However, an earthquake in A.D. 71 left the city so devastated that it never really fully recovered. Now, in his message to the church at Sardis, Jesus changed the order of his previous messages to the churches by issuing a rebuke first. So in this case, he gives the rebuke first. The church at Sardis had a reputation for being alive, but in reality, they were spiritually dead. Jesus said that he knew their deeds. He knows our deeds. He knows everything we do. He knows everything we think. All right? So we see that they, they were working. They were busy. He, they, he, Jesus knew their deeds, but their hearts were dead. So they stayed busy, but they really lacked the vitality of a true spiritual relationship or spirituality. Jesus described himself to them as holding the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now we know that the seven spirits of God are also known as the sevenfold spirit of God is a reference to the Holy Spirit. And, and, and really, we know that the number seven talks about the number of perfection. So when we talk about the sevenfold Spirit of God, we're actually talking about the Holy Spirit in His perfect plenitude. In other words, all that He provides, all that He gives, He is the enabler of the Messiah. So the, Christ is the Word and the Holy Spirit is the enabler of that word and reveals truth to us. So the Holy Spirit then is the source of spiritual and eternal life. And this was needed by the church at Sardis. So Jesus said that they were dead. In other words, they were lacking true life of the Holy Spirit. They were busy, but they were really lacking a vitality, walking and living in the Spirit. So now it is said that the citizens of Sardis thought more highly of themselves than they deserved because they had a long-standing history. Now, notice I said the citizens of Sardis. I wasn't saying the church at Sardis. Okay? Now, they had a long history. They had, as I said, a thousand years before the time of Christ. They were very wealthy. Because of their location on the high part of the craggy mountain, they had a sense of security. All right? They felt like that they, they could not be invaded. However, we know that the city had been invaded and conquered several times because the citizens of Sardis were not watchful of the enemies that they should have been. So because they had this false sense of security, because of their long history, their wealth, and their location, they felt like that they could not be invaded. And yet that meant then that they were really lax in being uh, watching for their enemies. They were not spiritually alert. And so that is why Jesus says to them, you need to be alert. Now notice also that... Uh, Jesus said he knew their deeds. They stayed, dead, they stayed busy and they were doing these kinds of things, but yet they, they, were, they were not really connected uh, through the Spirit. Now, notice also that Jesus' uh, warning to them says, Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. In other words, the only way for them to recover the spiritual life that they needed uh, for their very survival was to repent, and this Jesus commanded of them. So you've got a rebuke, but now he's also commanding that they repent because of that uh, not being spiritually alert, not watching against the enemies that could invade. And there, there's some great application. We'll come back to that in just a moment. But look at verse 4, where he gives a commendation for some. He says, most are dead, but there are some who are in the church who have not soiled their clothes with evil. And they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. So there were still some in the church at Sardis who were remaining spiritually alert, and they were faithful to Christ. 
by means of a continuing consecration in their life to Christ, they had not defiled themselves with evil. In other words, they kept themselves in the grace of Christ, and they were purified from the corruption of sinfulness around them. Uh, the reward promised to these faithful believers by Christ was likened to a Roman victory processional or a parade when, a, uh, when there was a, a military victory, they would come in, there would be white-robed citizens uh, would join the conquering hero in a victory parade. And so he's saying it's kind of likened to that, this promise is, that these faithful believers in Christ would be uh, prepared to be with Jesus in his victory celebration at his coming again at the end of the age. Wow, what a promise. If you remain faithful, you will be with me. You will be robed with me in white. You will join me, the conquering hero. You will be in the procession at the end of the age. Now notice in verse 5 and 6, that's the commendation. But notice the promise is that they're also that they would overcome evil by repentance. Look at verse 5. All who are victorious will be clothed in white. I will never erase their names from the book of life, but I will announce before my Father and His angels that they are mine. Right? Anyone who has ears to hear, let him listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. So the promise given to the faithful believers in verse 4 is also given to those in the church at Sardis who would overcome the evil by repentance. So those that were not spiritually alert, that if they became spiritually alert, they would gain the same promise. In other words, if they would repent, then they also would get that promise as well. So they too then would join in Christ's procession in the white garments that he provides. So in other words, as he said in verse 5, their names would not be blotted out of the book of life. Now it's interesting that the ancient Greco-Roman cities, they kept rosters of their citizens which became a source of pride. In other words, a census kind of thing. The citizens of the church in Sardis had the opportunity to be listed in heaven's roster, okay, as a citizen of the spiritual kingdom of God. And their triumphant Jesus would gladly announce their names, call off their names, list the names of the citizens of his kingdom, and we see uh, he would announce that before his heavenly Father. So, by hearing the Spirit's words in verse 6, and awakening from their deathly slumber, their spiritually deathly slumber, they would not miss that glorious promise made to them by Jesus. Now, the message of Jesus to the church at Sardis informs us today that being busy with religious activities is not the same as having a life-transforming spiritual relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ by faith, not by works. That's a result of your faith. Okay? And so we can slip into a spiritual deadness uh, while doing just a no-ending uh, barrage of religious things because we neglect to give a real attention to our daily cultivating of a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So, you say, all right, be spiritually alert. Well, how do you do that? Well, to remain spiritually alive, it's necessary that we consecrate ourselves to Christ on an ongoing day-after-day -day commitment to Christ. We have to be intentional, a committed, intentional commitment to Christ day after day. Christ is himself the source of our spiritual and eternal life, and we will not have any spiritual eternal life without him. He is the source. It's what he did. He left heaven, as Philippians chapter 2 tells us. He left all of that so that he could come in the incarnation, be born in human flesh, so that we might have eternal life. He came to die. He, he, yes, he came to set up a kingdom. Many have misunderstood that, but that's a spiritual kingdom. It will be a earthly kingdom at some point in the end of the age. However, we see that Jesus has come to die so that we might have life. Why? Because he loves us. He loves us. Now, this next church in uh, verses 7 through 13 is the message to the church at Philadelphia. And basically, that message is, hold on to Christ. Let's read those verses together. 
Write this letter to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. This is the message from the one who is holy and true, the one who has the key of David. That's interesting. What he opens, no one can close, and what he closes, no one can open. Okay, now this is actually a reference here to Isaiah 22, 22. All right, now notice verse 8, I know all things you do. Now notice what he said, he said that up here at uh, church, uh, church at Sardis, remember, what did he say? I know your deeds. Notice what he says here, I know all the things you do, and I have opened the door for you that no one can close. You have little strength, yet you obeyed my word and did not deny me. Look, I will force those who belong to Satan's synagogue, those liars who say they are Jews but are not, I, he will cause them or force them to come and bow at your feet. Okay, talking about those that are faithful at the church of Philadelphia. They will acknowledge that you are the ones I love. Because you have obeyed my command to persevere, I will protect you from the great time of testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to the world. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take away your crown. All who are victorious will become pillars in the temple of my God, and they will never have to leave it. And I will write on them the name of my God, and they will be citizens in the city of my God, the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. All right, notice, anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Here we see the, the message, the letter to the church at Philadelphia. Notice that there is no rebuke. There is a commendation, there is a command, and there is a promise. Now, it's interesting how the city of Philadelphia got its name. Uh, it actually came from the ancient king Attalus II. Attalus, A-T-T-A-L-U-S, Attalus II. And he succeeded his brother to the throne. Now, Attalus had demonstrated such loyalty to his brother before his death that he was dubbed Philadelphus, or the Greek word for love of brother. Love of brother. So this name he shared with the new outpost, Philadelphia, sit at the top, a, a uh, active uh, uh, earthquake fault. Now, this geographic uh, fact is alluded to in the message that Jesus sent uh, to the church here at Philadelphia. Jesus lavished praise on the Philadelphian church, and he did not issue a rebuke to them. Now, Jesus described himself to them as the one who is holy and true and holds the key of David. Now, in the Old Testament, God is called the holy and true God in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 25, and Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 10. Thus, Jesus is ascribing to himself titles of deity, okay? Because who is he? He is the the Son of God. He is God the Son, and Jesus declared himself to be the holder of the key of David. This key of David is mentioned in Isaiah 22, 22, and that is a messianic or a prophetic uh, verse of the Messiah, the descendant of King David, whose kingdom will never end. That is the kingdom of Jesus Christ. He is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. So as the holder of the key of David, Jesus says in verse 7, and the King James says, openeth, and no man uh, shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. So here we see Jesus describing himself, and he's encouraging the church that's faced with great persecution, and he's described as having little strength, or excuse me, the church is described, Jesus says, of little strength. You're weak. They don't have much strength, okay? but before whom Jesus had set an open door of opportunity. They're weak, but you, there's no rebuke. So the weakness was not because of moral failure or spiritual weakness. Okay, all right. It, it could have been maybe they were just uh, because they were being op opposed so difficultly and so hardly they were tired and weak. But notice it said, before 
whom Jesus had set this open door of opportunity to be victorious over those who opposed him. In other words, they would not be kept from experiencing the promises and the purpose of God. Their faithful endurance for Christ would be rewarded. So even though they were facing opposition, facing difficulties, they were hanging true to Christ. Okay, And the Lord said that he would keep them secure from the coming time of trial in verse 10. Now, Jesus does issue a command to the Philadelphian believers here in the church at Philadelphia. He says in verse 11, Hold that which is fast, thou, or excuse me, hold that fast which thou hast. In other words, go back to, let me go back to the uh, New Living Translation so it's a little easier to understand. I'm coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take away your crown. In other words, uh, this is what the Philadelphians had been doing. They were holding on. They were holding on to what they had. That's why he commended them for their faithfulness. Okay, they had been faithful, but he's commanding them to continue to be faithful to Christ and that he would come again and that he would reward them. And Jesus' warning that they not let anyone take their crown of life meant that it could be lost. In other words, this warning says, hold on to what you have so that you do not lose your crown of life. So in other words, that intimates that there could, that crown could be lost okay, uh, to their opponents, but only if they permitted it by ceasing to remain faithful to Christ. So stay faithful to Christ. We need to be faithful to Christ. Hold on and be faithful to Him and not let anyone take our crown of life. Now notice in verses uh, 12 and 13 here, there is a promise. And the promise, uh, and actually it's promises, uh, that Jesus made to the Philadelphian church are very rich in meaning. Notice the first promise, the Lord would make them a pillar in God's temple forever in verse 12. Notice that. Uh, and I, uh, all who are victorious will become pillars in the temple of my God. They will become pillars in the temple. Philadelphia, now notice, think about this for a moment. I just told you that the church at Philadelphia was situated and built on what? An active earthquake fault. Okay. That's like living on the San Andreas Fault in California. Okay. Uh, or some of the other faults the Garfield Fault, or other faults in California. So notice here that Philadelphia was very frequently uh, affected or rocked by earthquakes. So spiritually speaking, the Christians there were an immovable pillar. Even though the city may shake, they themselves, as the church, the believers in Christ, the Christians, were an immovable pillar. In other words, they're going, he also said, not only will... Will you be, a, I make you a pillar in the church, in the, in the Lord's temple. But he says, he would be identified by the Lord's name, okay? Uh, by the name of the new Jerusalem, and Christ would write on them his new name. So we would have his name written on us as his possession, as his people. And so their identity would be opposite uh, in opposite contrast to those who were marked as worshipers of the beast. So in Revelation chapter 13, those who worship the beast are marked by, in some way, to be his followers. But Christ here says that I am going to mark my believers. I'm going to put my new name on you. Okay, All right. So their identity then is also placed them among those who will enter into the new Jerusalem. We know that the new Jerusalem is going to be a city square, a cube that's going to hover over the earth. The earth is the Lord's and there'll be people on the earth and there'll be citizens in the city in the new Jerusalem. But he notice he says he promises here to those that are faithful in the church of Philadelphia that they're going to be able to wear his name and they enter into the new Jerusalem. So they're going to have his new name uh, uh, upon their foreheads. Now, what is Jesus' new name? Well, that's simple. Look at Revelation chapter 19, verse 16. Okay, It is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Okay, So, the name in which he is victorious, that's the name that shows that Christ is victorious over all the forces of evil. He's the King, capital K, of kings, little k. He is the Lord, capital L, over uh, of the lords, 
all right, the little L, okay? In other words, he's showing that he is victorious over all sources and forces of evil. He promises the Philadelphian believers that they would share in his victory. Now, how does that relate to us? Like the Philadelphian believers, there are many times when we may feel that we have little strength or we have little power against the evils in this world. No doubt some of you have thought that in the last three or four months. All that we've seen, the pandemic, all the, the rise up of evil and the, the, the brazenness of the evil and, and the inequities that we see in our society. We see this and yet we, we think maybe I'm weak. I don't have the power to stand against those kinds of evils. But I'm telling you, you do. If you do, you are in Christ. And so uh, the world may oppose us and they may oppose our faithfulness to Christ. But the truth is, is that it's our strength is not in ourselves. Our strength is in Christ Jesus. And so our dependence for victory over evil in the world is never on our strength. It's never on our ability, but it's only on the strength of the Lord Jesus Christ. He holds the key of David. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. He has all power and authority to triumph over evil on our behalf. I want you to take that personally. He can and will, if you will allow him, if you come into a right relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, he will empower you in you in Christ. You can overcome the evil in our world. So here again, what he says, these words of Jesus in John chapter 16, verse 33. In the world, ye shall have tribulation. What's tribulation? It's defined as pressure to conform to the world. Okay, we're going to be pushed and pressured to try to conform to the world. But Jesus says, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. In other words, Jesus is already victorious. And if we are in a right relationship with Christ, then that too means that we are victorious, that we will share in the victory. We will have victory also. Now, the last church, the letter, the seventh letter that we're looking at today is the church at Laodicea. And Jesus is summing his matches to them by saying, be zealous and repent. So obviously there is a rebuke here. In verses 14 to 20, we read, write this letter to the angel of the church in Laodicea. This is the message from the one who is the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's new creation. So again, he's identifying who the source of the message is, Jesus, but he's doing it in terms that he talked to John about in chapter 1. Notice verse 15, I know all the things you do. Okay, here's the third time we've heard this today. He's told the three churches, the church at Sardis, the church at Philadelphia, and at Laodicea, I know everything you do. I know your deeds. I know what you're doing. Okay. Notice he says that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other, but since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You say, I'm rich, and you don't realize, excuse me, I'm rich, and I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, all on spiritual terms. So I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire. Then you will be rich. Also buy white garments for me so that you will not be shamed by your nakedness. And ointment for your eyes so that you'll be able to see. This is a unique statement here. Salve or ointment so that you will be able to see. We're going to see there's something in Laodicea about that. Okay, notice also, I will I correct and discipline everyone I love. Not everyone he hates, everyone he loves. Notice it says, so be diligent and turn from your indifference. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. Those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne. Sit with me on my throne. Okay. Just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches located on uh, major trade routes. The, the city of Laodicea was noticed for its banking, 
It was noticed for its wealth. It was also uh, recognized uh, for a uh, production of a high quality wool uh, for making garments. There were also, some, geographically, there were also some hot springs located nearby, and those hot springs were used in the production of a very popular me, uh, uh, medicinal eye salve. Uh, and all of these things uh, were alluded to in the letter at Laodicea, showing how much the church there had become like their environment. So four things uh, noted here, their, their banking, their wealth, their production of wool, the hot springs, and the eye salve. All of these things are alluded to in the letter to the Laodiceans. In other words, we see that they had, had, had kind of been acclimated into the environment around them. The letter to the church at Laodicea is one of the longer of the seven letters. And notice that it begins with a rebuke, a command, but there is no commendation for the church here at Laodicea. All right, notice that after, the reminding, after reminding uh, the church at Laodicea who he is, he says, I am the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of all creation. Jesus identifies who he is in verse 14. He then immediately begins with his rebuke, and he informed them that, one, I know your works, I know everything you're doing. In other words, and then he says, you are spiritually lukewarm. Spiritually speaking, you're not hot, you're not cold, okay? Uh, the, the only thing really is, is to spit you out of my mouth. So Jesus' rebuke of the Laodiceans continues, though, and he said that they were deceiving themselves about uh, um, their real spiritual conditions. In other words, while they profess to be rich and increased with goods, uh, and as pointed out in verse 17, um, notice that he said, uh, you, you, you don't really have need of anything. Uh, he said, but in fact, actually, spiritually, you're wretched, you're miserable, you're poor, you're blind, and you're naked. So you may have all those things on the outside, but you're, you don't have them in your spirit, your spirit man. So the Lord's rebuke of the Laodiceans revealed the difference between their deluded self-perception or self, uh, yeah, their self-perception and uh, Christ's knowledge of them. So uh, Jesus sees them for who they really are, and they didn't see themselves as who they are at all. They didn't see the state of their spiritual condition. So he said that, you know, uh, they think they're well off. Jesus says you're in horrible spiritual condition. They actually think that they are uh, 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 much better than they actually are. Now, he says the Laodicean church is poor, naked, blind, and, and, and that's kind of interesting, okay? They're blind, okay? Notice they're blind. Though they're surrounded by gold, fine wool, and ISAV, yes, ISAV. Jesus called on them to obtain, in fact, that what they wrongly thought they already possessed. In other words, they thought they had these things. They were wealthy. Um, they, they had the gold. They had the wool. They had the, the I, medicinal ISAV that made from the hot springs. And they, they thought that they had all these things. But notice what Jesus says they're lacking is the spiritual opposite of what they thought they had. Okay, so they, these are all metaphors for their spiritual wealth, their spiritual holiness, and their spiritual vision. Okay, and they needed to obtain these things from Christ. So Jesus content, uh, concludes his rebuke of the Laodiceans with a reminder. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Okay, the King James. In other words, Jesus' love for them called for their repentance. And so there is a rebuke and a command, and the command is to repent. Repent, be obedient to Jesus, and that would restore fellowship back with Christ. Now, in verses 21 and 22, we see the promise that he gave to them. So in keeping with his promise to have fellowship with those who would give him entrance into their lives, if you'll open the heart's door and let, allow me in, then he promised uh, those who would overcome evil by trust in him, by faithfulness to him, that they would sit with him on his throne, all right, just as he sits on the throne with his Father in heaven. Now, the language here that's used here 
emphasizes a very close relationship between God the Father and God the Son, but also between the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. But we see that they have fellowship. But more importantly, that also means that the believers in Christ will also have fellowship with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. So to be sitting on the throne with God the Father and God the Son is a blessing that we just can't really comprehend. But think about it. It is the direct opposite of the condition in which they saw themselves. In other words, they were in the state in which Jesus found the Laodiceans. They're hot or cold. You're lukewarm off from my mouth. But if they were faithfulness, if they would repent and come back to the Lord, we see that he says that you will sit with me on my throne. So that's, that's totally opposite of the spiritual condition they find themselves in. There is a painting. Warner Christ at Hart's door. It's based on the scene by Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. It is a very radiant uh, Christ that's pictured knocking on the door. Now you're beginning to think of the picture. Some have observed that the door in this painting lacks any kind of latch or entry mechanism on the outside of the door. If you were to look at the painting, there is no doorknob. There is no latch. There's no way to, to get in. Okay? It has to be opened from the inside or from within. So the title of this painting speaks of the heart's door. This is an invitation of Jesus was addressed to the Laodicean church. Christ desired fellowship with the individual believers of the Laodicean church. He also desires fellowship and with the corporate church united uh, in worship and ministry. So think about that. Christ desires fellowship with us. Okay? Within the, the, the vision of uh, chapter 1, Revelation chapter 1, indicates that Jesus is standing with his churches. This particular church had locked him outside. Think about that. Think of that, about that picture. Right? They were neither hot nor cold. He would spew them out. They were locked on the outside, right? Their hearts were locked, okay? They didn't understand who Jesus was. They didn't, uh, didn't have his radiance. They proceeded uh, basically in their church as work as usual, uh, and they were unable to see the spiritual wretched condition that they were in. Here's the thing. The same thing can happen to us today if we do not continually welcome Christ into our lives individually and also into the church, life of the church corporately. We need Christ. We need Christ. So I want you to think about, uh, I want to read a quote to you by Dr. C.C. C. Tracy. In 1911, Dr. Tracy visited the ruins of the city of Sardis. He says, when I think of the myriads of various nationalities and advanced civilizations for whose evangelization these seven churches were responsible. In other words, these seven churches sent the word around the world at that time. The message to the Christian communities occupying these splendid strategic centers filled me with awe. While established amid the splendors of civilization, they were set as candlesticks in the midst of gross spiritual darkness. Did they fulfill their mission? We may not know the answer to Dr. Tracy's question, but we can relate somewhat, can't we? We see we are a church. We are a light set on a hill for the city to see. The church looks to us for light. We are to be salt and light. We are candlestick in the civilization in the midst of darkness, gross spiritual darkness. We see that. It seems to be getting darker by the moment, yet at the same time we are to burn brighter than ever. So we have the opportunity to hear the Spirit's messages and respond in faithfulness to Christ. The only in this way will we be assured of fulfilling God's divine mission that He's given to us. So. What's the point? What's the point of last week's lesson and, to, and today's lesson, looking at the two? It really causes us to examine our heart, 
Um, and when you examine your heart, if we need to repent, we need to repent. Um, we need to respond uh, and allow um, a, a freshness of His presence, a freshness and a newness of His Spirit uh, in us. Allow the work, the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. And if we do this sincerely, then uh, we, like the churches uh, in Revelation 2 and 3, we will see the promises that uh, He affords to us. Father, I thank You for the Word of the Lord today. I thank You, Lord, that we have the opportunity, Father Lord, to hear and to learn from the churches and those who have preceded us. Father Lord, and that we, Lord, will not make the same mistakes. So I pray, Father, Lord, that you would help us to be spiritually alert. I, help, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to hold on to Christ. And I pray that we would be zealous. And, Lord, that we would repent of anything, any wrongdoing, any ill attitude, any lack of, of attention, Lord, to who you are. Um, uh, forgive us, Lord, for uh, any sins of presumption. Uh, of where we think we have what we need when we really are wretched and miserable. Forgive us, Lord, of these things and allow us, Lord, to be a dynamic church individually as well as corporately that we give you praise and glory and honor in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. All righty. The Lord bless you. See you next week.